Step right up and join the most vibrant circus community in the world, CircusTalk.com. This is In Center Ring. I'm your host, Jonathan Lee Iverson. A naturally gifted performer, this master juggler has mesmerized audiences with his unique brand of entertainment. From the Ivy Leagues to the White House and across the globe, In Center Ring presents Paris, the Hip Hop Juggler. Now you're a native of New York City? Yeah, Harlem born and bred. I love your story, man, because I, I was, of course, doing my due diligence. So I said, I got to really bite into this guy. I'm really interested because I think we're kindred spirits in, in the respect that New York is such a vast place. It's so deeply embedded with so much different culture and options. And you, like me, went probably an unconventional route. And with all the things you could do in New York City, with all the other options you could uh, venture into, why juggling? Well, there, there obviously was a love for hip hop and basketball. It just, it was there. So let's just say I had dreams of being an NBA player and I had dreams of being a rapper and a lot of us did. But right. um, in my school, when I was nine years old, there was a circus program um, sponsored by the Bay Apple Circus where they'd bring professionals come in, to come in and they would have professional mats, they would have professional equipment, and for free, twice a week, for the entire school year, any kid in the neighborhood can come and learn circus, just like any ordinary after-school program. And I used to love stunts, I used to love danger, and I was that kid in the park who your parents tell you not to play with, because that kid's jumping off the monkey bars, right. doing flips. And even at home, I couldn't contain myself. I'm jumping on the bed, I'm doing flips, I'm doing twists and all that. So one day uh, I was on detention at my school. I got in trouble a lot. And I used to, I used to always play the trick of asking to go to the bathroom. Yeah. And really you just kill time. You roam around, you don't go to the bathroom. And I saw my school's gym transform into a circus training studio. Wow. And I saw a mini tramp, saw a mini trampoline, and I saw kids jumping and getting so much higher than my bed. Because the problem with my bed, it wasn't launching high enough in the air. With that thing, that thing was launching kids 10 feet in the air. So I was like, Mom, please put me in that program. And she said, only if you behave. So um, yeah, I joined the circus program when I was nine. Uh, right. I was in it for two years, circus after school. And I, I came in as an acrobat, but they started to notice I could do a lot of stuff. Uh, first off, um, I had really good balance. I was doing a lot of rolling globe. Um, and then um, I think there was a point where they would have a spring show. And this was usually only for the older kids, the seventh and eighth graders. I was in fourth grade. But one of the instructors just saw me and was just like, you, trapeze. And oh. I didn't, but I wanted to be in the show. So I said, fine, trapeze. So I did trapeze um, in the show, but when it was time for mini tramp, that was my thing. When it was time for tumbling, tumbling, that was my thing. Um, okay. By seventh grade, I got into the affiliated school that had the circus program inside the school. So it, it was taught, circus not only was after school, but by the time you were in seventh grade, they taught it in the school's curriculum. It was a performing arts school where you can major in um, dance, singing, acting, your traditional performing arts, but then also circus. So naturally mm. I became a circus major and uh, I wanted nothing to do with juggling. Juggling was for nerds, juggling was for clowns, <laughs> juggling didn't get you any girls. We wanted, <laughs> and it wasn't just me, but then a new juggling teacher came, Russell Davis came in. And um, he had a completely different approach where we were forced to take a juggling lesson. Of course, mm -hmm. we're all cool and tough and we're like, Psst. and he says, all right, juggling, here's what I'm gonna teach you. 
I don't want to juggle. Why not? Juggling's for clowns. And I'm not a clown. And the teacher goes, Russell goes, I'm not a clown either. Wait, but you juggle. So that doesn't mean I'm a clown. So, so wait, wait, hold up. So, so I don't want to wear those stupid shoes that they wear. And he's like, you don't have to wear dumb shoes. Like, really? I don't have to wear clown shoes. Nope. Juggling is what you make of it. Right. So can I wear my Air Jordans? Sure. Can I play my art music? Yeah, sure. Whatever. And from there, he had us hooked. So wow. six months later, we're performing in the street at a festival and a bunch of black kids with Air Jordans, jeans, and, and Dr. Dre playing in the background. Well, I think that really goes along with the Harlem way, you know, and that I guess that New York ideology of being an individual, you know, and I mean, of course, especially when you live, in, you come from Harlem, you come from just that area. Everybody has this, this, this kind of beautiful struggle of wanting to carve out their own identity. God, I mean, you ended up carving out an entire uh, uh, brand, so to speak, in your juggling that is specific to you. So if you can really just um, tell me about what were the steps that you, you had to take as far as your training, as far as crafting Paris the hip hop juggler. Ooh, okay, well, first I had to get hooked to juggling and um, Russell Davis, my teacher, had a really clever way to get us hooked. And, Basically, um, in our classes, we would have our periods of juggling. And then if we're doing a good job, he would let us borrow them, borrow the juggling balls, take them home. But we have to give them back the next day. And if we do good on a Friday, that means we can keep them for the whole weekend. So mm -hmm. with the idea that it was temporary, we cherished that time. So we know we're going to have to give them back. So we're gonna, we're gonna get our time worth on this one. Let me try to get as many tricks as I can. And what we didn't know, because we're a bunch of 12 and 13 year old kids, we didn't know that he did that on purpose, where he added value. He made practice time precious. So mm -hmm. we, valued, we valued practice by being tricked into believing that, um, that, that we were being rewarded with the opportunity to practice. Uh, wow. Had he had he made it sound as if uh, it was homework or a requirement, none of us would have done it. But he he made it he made it sound like it was a privilege, like this is your opportunity, and that got us. So, as the best juggler in the class, I got to take them home a lot. And then mm -hmm. there was a point when you said, "Bring them back at the end of the month." And then of course at the end of the month he goes, "You can keep them a little longer, another month." I had no idea to the end of the school year. He gave me those shuttling balls. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, you know, it was it, every time I was treating practice as if it was my last opportunity to try. And with that, you're going to find a lot of things to do with it if you truly appreciate your time working on it. Mm -hmm. If you really find that joy in what you're doing and you really become so... Um, so passionate about the details of learning and growing something. So when you think about something like juggling, you mentioned that, and this is true, oftentimes people don't take it very seriously because their expectations are so low. But here's the other side of it. If their expectations are so low and you come in and you aren't terrible, you already blew them away. So now, you blow them away with three, and then you whip out a fourth one, and then you whip out a fifth one, and you're a 12 year old who looks like a nine year old, then you, you, you have them at hello. And that's something that has stuck with me my whole life. Now, in terms of the hip hop juggler thing, I didn't realize I was doing anything different. Harlem hip hop's played everywhere. You know, even your teachers are using rap references when they talk. So, it, I was just being myself because okay. I was allowed to be myself and myself was hip hop. So I didn't really get the connection until I was on the Today Show 
when I was 14. And Al Roker goes, ladies and gentlemen, hip hop's first juggler. And then the Al Roker. That, uh, <laughs> yeah. And then that, I was like, okay. So when I became a professional as an adult, I couldn't run by the name Paris. You know, I don't do the whole full name right. thing, just the first name. But when you Google Paris, you get some city in France for some reason. So I had to think, what have I ever been called? And I've always been called Paris. It just sounds like a nickname. So that's what it was. And then I remembered Al Roker saying, hip hop's first juggler. And then I said, hip hop juggler. That's who I am as a professional performer. When do you really start getting serious? Like what, what age, what, what time of your life when you really looked at this and said, you know, this is more than just a hobby. This is more than something I really like. This is something I actually want to make a living doing. I always secretly wanted to do that when I was a kid. So even when I was 12 years old and got my first check for juggling, $25 at the Big Apple Circus Gala, that was my first gig ever. Um, I got that check and I said, I can get used to this. Of course, wow. when you're 12 and you're from the hood, $25. dollars like, wow. Yeah. Uh, but, um, the truth was something about being paid for something that I truly created really meant something to me. It, it, it meant more than just um, working a job and you're part of a company and then the company pays you because the audience watches me do what I worked on. There isn't a chain reaction that eventually leads to the company's profit they clap for my act or my portion of the act and that really worked for me and i always was into entertainment anyway i i i grew up watching eddie murphy on snl and seeing a young black man a, a black teenager just on tv just being a young black teenager on tv being himself that meant something to me so yeah. thinking back to how Blackness as an art with just being ourselves, it just worked. And juggling, I found that entertainer in myself that I always wanted. Um, I started off as a model when I was a kid, but then juggling really felt like mine. So right away, I thought, I want to do this professionally. The problem is when you're a kid and you tell adults you want to be a circus performer as a professional, they're always going to tell you, you know, you should get a real job. Right. So I constantly lied. And I said, I want to be an accountant. I had no interest in being an accountant, but that's what I said. And, uh, but yeah, deep down, even after I went to college and graduated, I still wanted to do this. Mm -hmm. Where did you go to college? I went to Manhattanville College. It's um, okay. in Purchase, New York. It's very, it's walking distance from SUNY Purchase. It's a small liberal arts college. Um, I really like the environment there because, once again, it was um, it was a it was a vibe that really embraced culture and really mm -hmm. embraced the individual. Yet still, people looked out for each other, and it reminded me, in a way, in a strange way a lot like the circus, where everybody comes from their own walks of life, they land in the same spot, and everybody's different, but everybody wants everybody to succeed. It's daring to actually approach your parents and say, hey, I'm gonna be a juggler. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because, That's you know, I, I remember, yeah, I remember telling my father, man, God rest his soul, man, he was an immigrant from Trinidad. Immigrants don't come to this country for hopes and dreams. They come for practical work. And so telling yeah. him, I'm gonna be a singer. He's like, <laughs> he's like, nah, <laughs> nah. But nah, you know, man, I, I totally get it. My mom's from the islands, she's from the Virgin Islands. So yeah. you get yourself a hospital job because hospitals never run out of business, right? Or you become a teacher or something that's super practical that 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 is part of a system that won't fail. The moment you start jumping into things like the arts or creative jobs, it's like. Oh, uh, I love you, but because I love you, I really wish you would do something I believed in. Right. And they mean well. They, they really mean yes, well. They I never held it against him at all because I knew what perspective he was coming from. But strangely enough, he was supportive. 
even though he was giving me applications to go be a Port Authority police officer, I was like, once again, government <laughs> job, something that can't go out of business. It's that island practicality. Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, I would love, you know, because when I, when I go talk to a lot of students, especially uh, young men and women in the arts, that's the first thing that, you know, when they ask me the questions, they're like, you know, how do I approach my family about this? This is what I really want to do. But they're like, no, you need to do something more practical, more safe. How were you able to maneuver yourself that young, knowing what your family's expectations were? How are you able to courageously maneuver yourself toward what you really are? Well, I didn't announce it to them as a kid. I actually, I went to college, graduated, and got me a job job where I had a laptop and a case and wore slacks and a button-down shirt. And I did that for like two or three years. I was an account manager for a software company. And um, nothing made my mom prouder than seeing me go to a job and come home and repeat that Monday through Friday. But that was just driving me crazy. And um, just because I was good at it, didn't mean that that's what I should have been doing. Mm -hmm. And there's some people who don't really weigh personal fulfillment too high if they're getting you know, certain things in life that are hard to get. You know, their finances are good. They have a plan that they can make, you know, a decade plus out, please the parents, et cetera. But that wasn't enough for me. And I think one particular day was when um, I was hanging out with uh, my friend, professional juggler Marcus Monroe, and he street performed um, down in Union Square in Manhattan. And he just, he, he wanted me to come with him because we were just hanging out anyway. and. I had the most fun mm -hmm. just watching, and he didn't make a whole ton of money that day. Uh, he actually got fined for, uh, for illegal fireworks in the park or Ill illegal pyrotechnics in the park for his act. But I saw a man who was truly living mm -hmm. and work never felt the same. And within a month, I, I had to leave my job. So with my parents, and specifically my mother, because she's an island girl, um, I think because I established that trust of, I know how to get things done. You know, I did all the things, I did the college, I did the getting a job and keeping a job thing. Something about that, me being 24 years old and being very serious, it resonated to her. So she said that she didn't like the fact that I was leaving the job, but she did trust that I would make good decisions. Hmm. And naturally you did, because, I mean, she had to look up and see you on uh, The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, <laughs> or see you. I, I was blown away. Like, you have this diverse performing resume. I mean, you've gone from The Daily Show to MIT to the White House. You know, I mean, I, I, I need to hear about, like, what is... How have you surprised yourself in your career? This entire thing is a surprise to me, really. Because um, you can put a lot of work in and, and not see much tangible stuff from it. It happens all the time, all over the place. But um, thankfully, thankfully, I've been able to really land on some cool things. Um, another thing is that um, I... I'm, I'm not, I didn't live the circus tour life. I like having a home base and then going and coming back. So that takes away, of course, the wonderful opportunities that they have of in all these different cities and being able to tell these great stories, sometimes throughout the world. But because of that, I am local, which means I do have the freedom to take these things when they're around. And I can establish myself in a city and really gain a reputation in one spot, which means that if things come up and they need a juggler, um, they might think about me, which helps me. So, of course, there are trade-offs 
uh, in all aspects of our careers. You, of course, know all about that because you did Ringling. But um, I can say that I'm happy with the way things turned out so far. Are you self-managed as well? Do you have an agent or it's just you? I do a lot of it myself. There are a number of companies I affiliate myself with, a number of agents, depending on specific industries that I affiliate myself with. So it's it's a mix. Um, it's not like uh, it's not like Entourage, where you know you have one agent gives you a call in the morning and then asks you what you want. There is grinding involved in what I do. Um, there's research involved in in my setup. Um, and of course, there are things like forecasting and things like that, trying to figure out where's the next area to go, what's the next venture to try to get into, uh, opportunities of that nature. So um, there's there's more hustle and grind to my side for sure. Uh, but at the same time, I really, it where my setup works well for me, it might not work well for, someone who wants who prefers to keep the same employer and not have to keep looking out for different things but i actually do like the fact that i i can get into different ventures on the fly if i wanted to or take something that lasts a long time if i wanted to it um it creates that um i guess you can see it creates that that freshness all the time mm -hmm. what i'm doing so yeah i mean it's um it's something that I think I wouldn't recommend it for everybody, right. but it's definitely something that I'm really happy that I'm doing this way. So, you know, let's say, how do you approach, let's say a daily show as opposed to a junior high school assembly? With my setup, I do have to be very versatile where the daily show might want a specific thing that lasts 45 seconds, but has to be, exactly on target when they turn the camera on and of course they're still gonna want my professional input so they want something that reaches their benchmarks of what they think will hit the most that'll be the funniest that will fit their agenda the most so they're asking me as an expert hey so we had this idea what do you think can work and um trevor noah i gotta say had been incredible to work with hmm. if you want to talk about um, a fully, just a brilliant man, so well-rounded, but then also he made sure that everybody in his staff was happy, um, everybody in his staff felt important. And a lot of times, and this is true with TV especially, you might see color on the camera, you might see color uh, when you're watching the TV screen, but behind the camera, it is Snow White back there. They're not hiring anybody who looks like you and me. And they, they create that illusion because, you know, you might, you might see some black people with certain roles and this and that and the other, but then all the camera people, all mm -hmm. the makeup people, all their, all their production assistants, even the people handing coffee, yeah. they, their, their, their aunts, their, their, their nieces, their, the golf buddies. And um, Trevor Noah made a conscious decision to make sure that there was color in front of the camera and there was plenty of color behind the camera. So oh that was great. But um, the assembly on the other hand, if it's a middle school assembly, I'm also looking at what that audience, what fits for that audience. So typically a middle school assembly is gonna want something that spices up their day. Uh, a middle school isn't, isn't a group of third and second graders. So those are kids who, who want to feel kind of like their adults, but at the same time, you want to make sure that you're within the clean lines of what the school wants. So that means things that are culturally relevant to the kids that they'll understand. So I'll use a lot of modern music, a lot of modern, uh, modern joke references, things like that. And then the way that I talk to them, I talk to them almost adult-like to make them feel pretty grown up. And they're going to want something that lasts a school period, probably 40 minutes, probably 45. So with that, there, there's more variety, there's more jokes, there's more audience volunteers. So I have a lot of different versions of my set. And that allows me to be just about anything that a particular, um, that a particular venue is looking for. Granted that it fits, of course, what I do. 
but it I make sure that it's adaptable to whatever it is so that when I go to the daily show I'm not trying to kick 45 minutes worth of jokes and at the same time if I go to the the middle school assembly or state fair I don't only have 60 seconds of material who are, who are your um who are your artistic icons when it comes to your craft it's funny but I I really growing up like I said before I loved Eddie Murphy mm -hmm. because he him on SNL just coming on stage live every day being so comfortable and he didn't compromise at all he was himself regardless of what the audience looked like the rest of the staff looked like and he was representative of where he was from he, you know he's a, he's a new yorker uh he's, he's he's a young black man growing up in new york who, had, who found a lot of of popular culture funny so he told it he made fun of it in a way that I have People in the Bronx laughing, people in Brooklyn laughing. And um, I love that. Uh, I love Magic Johnson. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a basketball fan and Magic Johnson's my guy because once again, a point guard is supposed to pass the ball, but he made passing cool. He made passing an art mm -hmm. while everybody else is passing directly to the guy that they're looking for. He will do the no look pass and he will do the bounce pass and he'll throw it under the legs and, he made it he made it more than what the textbook standard was right. so he was still himself even he technically was playing a sport which is something that you know there's a clear objective but he said no that's not good enough and five championships multiple mvps so he he he, he got the job done but he didn't just do the job and those two things right there in terms of entertainment, even though they didn't do the same thing as me and didn't do the same thing as each other, those things really worked for me in terms of, okay, yes, I've been given this. How do I put my own spin on it? Mm -hmm. so. Obviously, you're aware of your, your ambassadorship. You know, when you go out, you're likely going to be the only one. And I think it, you're likely going to be probably for most kids, You've never seen a, a, a black person juggling. And you know, how aware are you of that? How how much of that goes into your presentation? You know, how you carry yourself, how you bring yourself to your audience. I'm incredibly aware. Um, and it's not to the degree where I'm walking on eggshells, but I do understand that what I'm doing is more than just entertainment. Um, it's also I'm also a recruitment tool when it comes to showing black people you can be a black person and juggle it's it's okay like every kind of juggling that you that you saw that you thought was juggling didn't look like this and that's a good thing so a good example was um i was in the kentucky state fair and it was three 30 minute shows for 12 days straight so that's 36 shows with just me on stage. And the same thing happened where you had, um, I guess it was me and a magician alternating shows. So I think if I was 11 o'clock, he was at 12, I was at one, et cetera. And his show would have like 80 to 90% full. And it's like 300 seats. My show to start, would be 50% or less. Because when you think just blindly, magic versus juggling, people's minds can relate to something enjoyable right away with magic, no matter what age they are. When it comes to juggling, because people are so used to seeing it done either poorly at a kid's birthday party or um, in a way that they can't relate to, right away they're like, juggler, pss, but then what happens is I come on stage and it's rap music blasting immediately and they see a black person come out. And then afterward, it's, uh, I start off with basketballs. So right away I'm doing dribbling with one, two, three, then four. Next thing you know, my 50% gets 70%. Throughout the show, 80%. Later on, 100%. By the time I'm done, 
it's 100 plus because people are standing. And I think that's important. So similar to, um, similar to Eddie Murphy at SNL, where he showed what a young black man can do on TV when given the opportunity, I'm showing what a, what a black juggler can do. And I'm showing where juggling can go in a way that's relatable, even if you're not black, even if you're somebody who, who just wants something that references today's times, culture, et cetera. And it means a lot that people out there, whether they're kids, whether they're adults, have, have uh, artistry expressed in a way that, that really challenges their previous thinking. And mm. especially when it comes to the dearth of, um, of black jugglers, all the 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds who see that, they might pick up some juggling stuff later. That's awesome. I mean, all of that from just being yourself. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, How oh, about I, that? I, I don't have to grease my hair. I just, I'm just being myself. I can just be myself and, and the reactions there. You know, I, and it was very important for me to have you speak on that because, you know, we constantly hear it over and over again in the entertainment industry, you know, well, people won't react well to what you all are putting out there. <laughs> and for some reason, hit after hit, you know, we see it all the time. I mean, speaking of Eddie Murphy, I mean, I think so many people forget how humongous his, his, his films were, Coming to America, Classics, Boomerang, all those, those were like $100 million plus, you know, blockbusters, easy. And people still are like craving Coming to America, but it resonated, you know, across cultural lines. I mean, I think there's a thirst for people to just enjoy something that's genuine. And um, I think yeah. that's your magic touch, honestly. It's just you're being genuine. That's freedom, man. That is absolute freedom. I really want to get to the science of what you do, you know, um, because I've always been impressed with jugglers. I mean, ever since I, I ventured into the circus and seeing the work that goes into it. And, and when I'm talking about like the highly skilled ones, I juggle like three balls, but that's nothing. Everybody can do that. But to see not them, everybody can. No, no, you're right. <laughs> I give you credit for three. <laughs> but to see people, you know, do it at a really high level and the work that goes in, because it seems like, you know, similar to trapeze, it's like something you just have to do. It's a muscle you have to train constantly. So how much work do you actually put into just your just everyday maintenance? Yeah, it's um, it's crazy how it works out because um, clearly when you see somebody juggling five, six objects, the time that they put in, no, nobody is that talented. And, um, you know, as, as black performers and black entertainers, often people like to say, oh, well, that person is just talented. That person's just athletic. And it's like, no, we all put the work in, even if we look like this. <laughs> so when it comes to juggling, the same thing applies. Um, it's ugly practice. It's, um, but you have to embrace the ugly. You have to embrace the boring. I think um, a great example is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar with his hook shot, where he mastered a shot that was impossible to block and wound up playing beyond 40 years old. Mm. And still, to this day, nobody has caught him in terms of the number of total points scored for a career because he mastered the, the unblockable shot. So all you have to do is just think, oh, why don't I just learn that? But then when people in the NBA tried it, they saw the boring work it took of just sitting, drilling that boring shot. And most people turned away because they didn't, they just didn't have it in them to sit and do what it took to truly get mastery of something. Juggling is that every single time. When it's three, when it's four, back at square one, five, back at square one, different prop. And you have to embrace the ugly, the boring, or else if you only embrace the accolades of having an audience clap for you, you're not going to be able to withstand any setbacks in your practice um, 
or um, things that just take a long time. You learn three, you're not going to learn four as fast. You're definitely not going to learn five as fast. And you're definitely not going to learn seven nearly as fast as five. So, mm -hmm. yeah. What are you most proud of in your career? Mm -hmm. Sesame Street. Sesame Street. <laughs> I know it's silly because um, I, I didn't come on as the hip hop juggler. I came on as a, as a character. But watching that show, age four, age five, age six, and just the magic of Sesame Street, it just resonates across generations. And now that I have a daughter who's nine months old, you know, she's going to be watching Sesame Street coming up soon. And she'll get to grow with that and know that her father was a part of it, too. And uh, something about that just universal understanding of what Sesame Street is. It, it's... it's uh, I, I, I could not put it into words how happy I was to be there and how thrilled I was that they didn't cut that episode. <laughs> <laughs> that is so awesome, man. Well, you know, now that we're in this pandemic, things have changed. Um, it's no secret that live events have taken a huge hit and that is your business. Um, and we all are kind of reeling, you know, um, in, in our own way. How do you um, refocus yourself, reinvent yourself possibly? What does Paris the Hip Hop Juggler do going forward? So when I first got the news, I was supposed to be on the airplane the very next day to fly to a college in St. Louis and be a part of their theater program for two weeks to in circus for one of their theater productions. And then I get a call saying, we're not sure if we want someone from New York flying to our campus right now. <laughs> and then uh, an hour later, they called back and said, well, we closed that campus, so you're not going anywhere. Wow. And I just had to sit and think, man, you know, this is bad. And I saw it coming because they shut the NBA season down. Mm -hmm. So I knew it was, uh, I knew it was a, a chain reaction coming soon. But I, I saw my calendar just wipe clean and all those shows I was super excited about, no longer there, included some great work I wanted to do at a circus program, an outreach program in Oakland, while also doing cabarets in San Francisco that same week. And I had to let go and I had to understand who I was on this earth and why I'm here. And as much as we take our work seriously, you know, we our work doesn't define our existence to be here it doesn't justify our existence to be on earth. And the next day, you know, I woke up and I was sad and then went to see my daughter in the next room. And she's still excited to see me, <laughs> you know, it's not an audience, but she's happy every time. And that helped me understand things that matter in life. And um, I found a new connection to artistry there. And especially with being in tune with all the all the social um, uh, hot button topics that are going on, specifically when it comes to our race relations, because I was more in tune with what I was about and why I'm here, I was able to reflect that in, in arts pieces that I was doing. So, of course, we talked about versatility and how I have to be versatile because there's so many different things that I get involved in. That versatility really helped here because mm -hmm. I had so many different versions of what I do that it fit in a bunch of different mediums. So there were a variety of shows that were going online that wanted videos submitted. Got it. Oh, we liked your last one. We want another one. Of course I got another. Got it. <laughs> you know, uh, we want this thing. Got it. And um, at the same time, I, I, with my teaching background, I was teaching virtual and I'm still teaching virtual private lessons as well. Um, and because of my teaching background, I'm now, uh, I got a call from uh, an outreach program in Hunts Point in the Bronx, The Point, and I used to uh, teach with them years ago, about eight years ago, and they really wanted some virtual classes for their virtual circus program, and they were trying to think of who could pull that off, and they called me, so I'll be working with them quite a bit this summer, and um, there are also some 
No, also some shows that did have dates that have reopened. Um, Connecticut's doing well with the COVID handling and outdoor shows, socially distanced. So those shows are still on a different versions of the show. But of course, you know, adaptability, I've, I've been comfortable doing that. So, you know, um, I guess not being part of, of, uh, of one situation really helped me adapt much quicker than a lot of my friends, unfortunately. Hmm. Well, Paris, the hip hop juggler, it's been an honor. This is really, you are a guru. You've dropped some gems, man. You really dropped some hey, gems. Hey, I will trade you a few three ball tricks if you pass on to me some of your vocal ability. Just a little <laughs> bit for day. I just want a little bit of that vocal so I could be up in a coffee shop and just blow everybody away. You know, it's all I got, man. I mean, because you would kill me athletically. I, I only look intimidating, but I was a joke on the basketball court. My friends, they tell you, man. I mean, it, the only thing that saved me was I could, I could go sing somewhere. It was shameful. I broke that stereotype so much. I mean, I was getting killed <laughs> by dudes five foot five and shorter. <laughs> <laughs> hey, brother, listen, hey. this has been a pleasure, man. I really appreciate you taking the time. I wish you nothing but the best. And again, congratulations on your new baby. Um, and I can see it in your yeah. eyes already, man. You're like, you're right there. You know, this is really growing you up even more. It's a wonderful adventure, man. It's a wonderful adventure. Enjoy every second of it. Absolutely. You know, um, oftentimes we're told as professional entertainers that we have to make a choice. You know, you either have a career or you have a family. And obviously, of course, with your kids, you know that that's not true. <laughs> so right. if, I ever have any, uh, if I ever have any place to look, I'm looking right at you. <laughs> I appreciate that, man. I really do. Thank you so much for this, man. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. All right, man. Thanks Paris, the hip-hop juggler, the one and only. Black experience in circuses go back hundreds of years, and we do it with our with our own style. The circus has been a microcosm of the outside world. Many of the same prejudices are, are, that you see in the outside world are present in the circus. So it's moving past the vision or the limited vision that the society has for you and stepping into the talent and skill that you know you have to go forward as a performer. Hi everyone, my name is Sierra Rhodes Nichols. I am the founder of Seesaw, connecting circus students around the world. Um, I started Seesaw two years ago with the hopes of helping circus students find the schools right for them. We're now expanding Seesaw to help provide other types of resources and this is our first adventure into fundraising. So help us raise $15,000 to create micro grants for US circus artists of color. Seesaw wants to be sure to center people of color in this campaign, so thank you to the artists who have volunteered their time and support to be featured in this video. The artists you see here are amazing circus artists whose work we want to promote and amplify in our fundraising efforts. This fundraiser is a call to action for the circus community. As we recover and rebuild our art form, we need to provide resources and pathways for representation in circus. Funding for circus in America is sparse, and Seesaw wants to help pave the way for more financial aid in circus as a whole. These micro grants will be available for U.S. circus artists of color to pay for circus education, shows, videos, or anything that fits the application criteria. Thank you for your time and support. I started this fundraiser with Seesaw team member Kevin Flanagan. We realized that in the fight for social justice, mistakes will inevitably be made. So please feel free to ask questions, raise concerns, or call us out on any platform. Instagram, Facebook, or email us at seesawcircus at gmail.com. Help us raise $15,000 to create a more representative circus community. Donate now and tell a friend. Thank you. The circus is a vast international community. 
and there's only one place to connect for jobs, events, the latest news, and so much more. CircusTalk.com. Join today.